Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast with Matt Kelly and Tom Fox. This is episode three. In this episode, I wanted to take a deep dive into what it really means to have an appropriate uh, culture. What is culture? What is tone at the top? How is it permeated through the organization? We use the vehicle of the recent scandals involving the Canadian pharmaceutical, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, to take a look at uh, overall corporate tone, uh, what it means to push the envelope, what it means to have a very dynamic CEO who seems to always get his way, and what it may mean for a company down the road. The episode comes in at just under 24 minutes. Uh, once again, it's uh, Compliance Into the Hello Weeds, a podcast Tom Fox, with Tom Fox and Matt Kelly. For our next we thank you very much for listening. Compliance Into the Weeds, where we take a deep dive into some subject that has piqued our interest. So, Matt, uh, welcome, and uh, I guess uh, happy spring to Boston. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It's always nice to be back on with you talking about these things. And it did snow the first day of spring for Boston, but... Uh, <laughs> We only got a small number of inches, and it has already melted away. So we are happy and in full swing for spring over here. Well, my daughter was actually there this weekend, and she attended her first uh, St. Patrick's Day parade. So she is now indoctrinated. (laughs) Possibly the first of many, because they are quite the tradition around here. So, Matt, you had a uh, blog post this week entitled, Why Culprit? Corporate culture is so matting a challenge that really piqued my interest, and I wanted to maybe use that uh, as a starting point to talk about uh, Valiant or some other corporate um, events recently. Uh, so why don't you tell us uh, kind of what led you to uh, write this blog post and where you, what you got from it? Sure. So this post actually came to me just by happenstance. I saw that earlier this week the uh, International Corporate Governance Network published a paper uh, in conjunction with the uh, Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators and the Institute for Business Ethics, uh, which are all three European uh, good governance institutes. Uh, Apparently, they had a roundtable of about 20 very senior governance thinkers and uh, leading men and women sometime around December, Of course, I was not invited, but I have picked my (laughs) ego back up and uh, continued on. Um, But that that roundtable was apparently to discuss corporate culture and to find good indicators of if your culture is working well or working poorly. Uh, The paper is only about five pages. You can find it on the ICGN website. Uh, That's the International Corporate Governance Network. I don't know the website off the top of my head, but um, I think it's ICGN.org. Look for this paper if you care about corporate culture and governance and compliance and read this paper. It is very insightful about the challenges around drivers of culture and good and bad. Um, My personal analogy for corporate culture and why it's so frustrating is that I think it's a lot like raising a child. I have a two-year-old in my house right now, so I'm very attuned to this challenge. It's very easy to identify bad behavior you do not want your child to have. Uh, you know, you Because we see examples of bad behavior all the time, and it's very much don't do this, don't do that, don't do whatever else. We don't really, as a society, have a clear sense of what good behavior looks like in a child, because so long as the child isn't bad, he is therefore good. And you can define the benchmark for good any way you want. I think that's a very similar dynamic with corporate cultures, that we can pick out bad behaviors we don't want to see in corporate culture, but we're still fumbling in the dark for what is a uniform standard of this is a good culture. We've won. We we have made the final triumph. We don't need to worry about it anymore. That's not the way it works. So I think that's why it's so hard. And the paper really touched on some very interesting examples there and um, well worth the time to read. Well, interestingly today, our friend Doug Cornelius wrote a blog post on warding off uh, unethical behavior, and he talked about putting garlic up. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure, although that might work in Transylvania, you know, perhaps it might not work in, in corporate America. But they, uh, you identified three of the 
the drivers of bad behavior. And I was wondering if maybe we could just kind of dive right into those. Uh, you talked about corporate stress. Mm-hmm. You talked about uh too much focus on short-term financial performance, uh, which I would say is the bane of every public re- reporting company. And then the tolerances of small breaches of uh, ethical rules or uh, company uh, codes that over time might compound a weak uh, compliance culture into something, unfortunately, larger. So why don't you maybe talk about uh, those three in, in the order you might want to explore them? Sure. I think I'll start with a tolerance of small breaches because that, I think, is the most tangible for most people. Uh, and I think it's very difficult to solve. But, um, you know, basically, we see small ethical breaches all the time. And uh, I think anybody who says we don't have small ethical bre- breaches is kidding themselves. I mean, this happens in every organization. Uh, the paper made mention specifically of one person at the round table. They don't identify who they, you know, it's Chatham house rules for the paper. But, um, the paper said that there was one executive. He knew senior executives at his organization were using the company aircraft for personal use, but the board who also knew about this and knew it was in violation of board rules, uh, let that go because these executives were, quote, working so hard. I have no doubt that the executives were working so hard, but it gets to what I think is really tough, that idea of ethical exhaustion. Humans can only be ethical for so long before we get tired. Our brains get tired just like a muscle gets tired, and by the end of the day, you know, you've racked up a great sale or you've had a really bad business trip that you're doing for the company and you say, you know what, I am going to order that porterhouse steak and have the 60-year-old scotch. I don't care about the spending limits. I deserve it. That's a very natural human thing to do. That dynamic of ethical exhaustion is what I think contributes to small breaches a lot. And it is valid to say that Small breaches, if they go unaddressed, become larger breaches. It, it speaks to bad culture. Um, Can I just stop you yeah. there? Because it seems to me exhaustion is really different than the example you gave, uh, because I, I would characterize it as more along the lines that uh, justification or I, I, you owe me this or the company owes me this. I, I made this big sale. I worked this 16-hour day. Somebody owes me something. Um, you know, it, it's a very related concept. It's a very good point to raise. And the people who study worker behavior and business ethics, and they're, they're all out there doing great work, they do single out that um, people almost see it as deposits and withdrawal in an ethics bank. I've been extra ethical and a good employee all this time, so now I deserve this little thing. And what's really going to be the harm in having a porterhouse steak uh, if the company's travel and entertainment budget for 11,000 employees is a billion dollars or something, you know what? It's not. It is not going to hurt the company, but it sets an ethical precedence. And, um, you know, these ideas of how you allow people to um, be normal humans, normal humans are going to get tired of things. Normal humans are going to sometimes feel like I'm owed this because I did work so hard on something else. How do you build an ethics system that admits and appreciates and works around those realities? I don't know, but it's um, it's we'd be foolish not to acknowledge those forces are out there. Your the force you mentioned and the force I mentioned. How about we turn to um, the focus on short term financial performance? Because I think you've you've really articulated uh, lots of thoughts on that over the year, particularly, uh, you know, when you're former at, formerly at, at uh, editor in chief at compliance week, uh, I recall several pieces you wrote that talk about that. Certainly if you've ever worked for a public corporation or looked at a public corporation, you know, the, the focus on short-term gain, um, is, is really paramount now. So how does this play into, uh, affecting corporate culture? Um, I think it affects it a lot. I think that, I don't know what the easy answer is because it is not as if the system of quarterly reporting in the United States is going to go away. It is here to stay. Um, it is not as if we are going to have less visibility into corporate governance or co- corporate activity 
and corporate financial performance. We only get more and more financial data in more and more real time if we want it. Um, and that's only going to increase. But our whole system of compensation for people, uh, performance reviews, promotions, and whatnot, it is largely predicated on your ability to meet a target. And those targets are set every 90 days. That's the way we do it here. I'm not saying it's the best. I don't think that it is. But um, public companies that are under this enormous scrutiny, enormous pressure to perform, uh, we see it all the time that uh, they are pressured to sacrifice long-term viability to achieve short-term gain. Uh, you mentioned Valiant Pharmaceuticals at the start of this. I mean, they're, I think, a picture-perfect example of it is that they wanted growth, growth, growth. And look at the mess that they're in. We can get to that in a minute. But, you know, we've seen many examples of that. You know, hedge funds come in, they've borrowed money to the hilt, they acquire a stake in a company, and they put pressure on people. Pressure is one of the fundamentals of uh, that the fraud triangle. Um, you know, you have some sort of need to do something. Maybe it's a personal need. You need cash for personal expenses, but just as often it can be, I have to make this bonus this quarter and I have to do this level of sales to be able to hit that payment or get that promotion. Um, yeah. And that really leads into the, the final uh, of the triumvirate, which is stress and stress levels. And so much of it can be imposed for no specific reason. Um, you know, Valiant Pharmaceuticals with its hugely ambitious growth targets, did it need to hit that? No. Uh, you know, I mean, nobody was going to burst into flames if Valiant grew only moderately as opposed to hugely. Um, yeah, I can remember one famous headline from sometime around the 2010 or something like that, but it was Goldman Sachs lays off thousands amid insufficiently large profits. Um, or insufficiently massive profits. Gold, <laughs> Goldman has always been huge. It's always been a very profitable company. Uh, but you know, if you have corporate stress, either from outside market expectations or inside from a jerk of a CEO, and uh, I will be gender neutral here. Jerks can be male or female, although they tend mostly to be male in my observation of corporate history and CEO jerks. But you know, you can have a jerk of a boss uh, who puts pressure on you. And that just leads to you potentially cutting corners or just tuning out and not caring. You know, every, everybody always talks about the drivers for where misconduct comes from or why people do or don't speak up about misconduct when they see it or report it to the whistleblower hotline. One statistic I've seen people not really look at is, you know, why do people not report misconduct? Are they afraid of their job or anything? Is it because that they just don't care? And we've seen plenty of people, I have, you have, I'm sure everybody listening, at large organizations who are paycheck players and don't really care. And that is a stress coping mechanism. If you're under a lot of stress, you just do what is necessary to get the boss out of your face and then don't care anymore. That's bad culture. That's where it comes from. It comes from stress of overbearing pressures. Let's maybe turn to Valiant because I found this to be just a fascinating uh, case study on a lot of different issues, uh, corporate governance, uh, financial accounting, uh, reputation, <coughs> excuse me, the value mm -hmm. of a company vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the trust uh, investors have in the company's leadership. Uh, you wrote a post, uh, maybe uh, for those not familiar with Valiant, it's a, a Canadian now pharmaceutical company which largely uh, its growth strategy was around acquisitions. They would take then low-priced drugs uh, from the acquired companies and jack them up some 500 to 5,000 uh, percent to increase their profits. They would uh, just slash and burn uh, the employee or the R&D base of the companies they bought because they weren't in the business of pharmaceutical uh, drug uh, research and development, but just uh, acquisition. They also had some other issues around um, – sales through uh, third parties that may have violated uh, stuffing the channel or other rev rec rules. And now the company has uh, lost approximately 90% of its value. It's lost its CEO. It's fired its CFO. And it's about as a public a meltdown as, as we've seen since uh, the early aughts. But one of the things that uh, really struck me early on when this 
uh, story started developing is you wrote a column about corporate government governance mm-hmm. and what that might say about an organization. So maybe we could start from the co- corporate governance aspect and, and maybe tie it into your, or at least discuss it around your blog post. Well, you know, I what I remember is um, I was just struck by fundamentally nobody at uh, at Valiance Board, apparently, I don't know, but nobody seemed to speak up and question whether a pharmaceutical company's strategy of acquiring businesses, laying off R&D and, you know, gutting your future pipeline, but acquiring drugs that do have a market and then, ex- you know, jacking up the price to extract revenue from them. Is that fundamentally a good business idea for a pharmaceutical company? Uh, because it sounds to me like a great way to make money in the 1910s or something and never get around to trying to discover antibiotics, um, you know, which were discovered in the 20s. And you know, nobody's stopping to think, what does this say about who we are and what our culture is? We're a pharmaceutical company that doesn't believe in developing new drugs. We believe in raising prices to extract revenue from people who need drugs from the sick. Um you know, if you simplify it down to its bare essence, there is some just serious, I think, moral implications about, is this really a company you want to work for? I, I don't know. It sounds like not a very interesting place to work to me. Um, but more than that, <clears throat> I think that it, Valiant opened itself up for the mess that it was, that now is in, is that we hear an awful lot these days uh, about the democratization of your company's brand. You're all out on social media. Everybody else is out on social media. Everybody's talking about everything. And as much as we in other avenues might talk about a lack of transparency still being a problem, companies are still far more transparent today about what they're doing, and it's easy to figure out. And this strategy of acquiring companies, gutting the R&D budget, raising prices... It it doesn't pass the smell test to me, and it didn't pass the smell test to a lot of others. And in a world of democratizing your brand, that's going to become pretty apparent. And in all good democracies, you can throw an idea out there, and the voters can still vote you down, which is what shareholders have now done. And Congress, when it held hearings about the, the nature of these sort of ideas, and Valiant wasn't the only one that has done this. Um, I think it is important for you and I to stress, for everybody listening, Valiant has not been accused of any wrongdoing yet. Nobody's been charged of any fraud. I don't know that it will happen or anything like that. It seems to have made a huge number of blunders on multiple levels, and we could talk about this all day long, but you know, nobody's saying that there's been any crime committed as of yet or any illegal activity. It just seems like it's dunderheaded activity that they were <laughs> baiting the world to pick on their strategy and say, your corporate culture stinks. Um, now, you know, when you get into it, this pharmacy benefits entity, Philidor, that they owned or had an option to own or buy for a dollar or whatever the details were, that seems strange. Um, and of course, that eventually was going to come out too, because this always comes out. Uh, and I just don't really see how the Valiant story would really have ended anywhere other than where we are. That's what I'm struck by there. I guess what your article raised for me was the following, uh, having me revisit uh, the early part of uh, the last decade where we saw WorldCom and Tyco um, base their business model on an acquisition strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a Ponzi scheme because you can only buy so many companies to get their uh, revenues and you just have to continue bringing in new companies so you can book that as revenue. And at some point you have to either digest what you have acquired or you have to put something in the pipeline that is uh, a new product or a new service as opposed to simply buying a new entities new entity and and that's what really struck me um about valiant that they just seem to be buying and buying and buying and that was their basic business model for growth without really developing anything new the the really the point that uh i wanted to see if we could even explore is is that if you have that type of uh business strategy or business model where you're acquiring 
or your growth comes through the acquisition of new companies, does that put pressure on or does it fit into any of these three categories that the Institute of Business Ethics uh, or, or rather the uh, International Corporate Governance Network has spoken to as a driver for uh, bad corporate governance? I, I certainly think so. And I agree with your point that, um, we, you know, again, while Valiant hasn't uh, been charged with accounting fraud yet, it what it seems <laughs> to be doing it reminds me a lot of WorldCom and Enron and all of those meltdowns we saw in the early 2000s, as opposed to the more risk management failures that we saw in the financial crisis, which you know, those are a different sort of you know, dunderheaded corporate governance. This is really – this is a throwback to what we would have seen like 15 years ago. Right. Um, but you know, remember, how would you actually implement an acquisition strategy? Well, you take up a lot of debt, uh, and so there's your pressure. There's your stress. You have to meet those numbers. Um, and then – the other interesting thing that I was thinking of is um, for those of you who are not acquainted with Jonathan Marks, who is a managing director at Navigant, Jonathan is a big proponent of the idea that the fraud triangle is incorrect, that there are two other elements, and it's really a fraud pentagon. And these two elements he talks about, um, they apply here, even absent any official fraud charges that may or may not be forthcoming. We don't know. Um but he points out that for really big corporate meltdowns, you also need arrogance and competence. You need a very arrogant CEO who dares to try to do whatever it is that he does. And that certainly was the case with WorldCom and Bernie Ebers, who took this you know, second-rate telecom company in Mississippi and built it into a gigantic fraud on M&A deals. Um, it was actually very similar to Tyco and Dennis Kozlowski. That uh, it's not as if Dennis Kozlowski was, you know, he was eventually charged on tax evasion, I believe. It's not as if Dennis Kozlowski was a poor man who needed to commit fraud to pay his bills. Uh, you know, most of these big corporate meltdowns involve larger than life CEOs, which was the case at Valiant, trying audacious plans and how dare the mere mortals on the material plane try to raise objections to them. Um, it, you know, and boards that acquiesce to these larger-than-life CEOs who are trying these brazen plans that, on paper, if everything goes right, I'm sure they would work. Well, here in the real world, nothing ever all goes right. You know, on a good day, most of what you want goes right, but something always goes wrong. And, you know, the other prosaic point to all this is, you know, it will Valiant really fall into life-threatening trouble, potentially, because uh, they d currently do not have any audited financial statements, not for 2015. They may have to rescind their statements for 2014. Without audited financials, their debt covenants are in jeopardy. They had $30 billion in debt to carry out all of this. And if these debt covenants somehow get called or become jeopardized, that's what puts a company into bankruptcy, is that you don't have the money on hand to pay the debt that's due right now. Again, I mean, you, Tom, you and I have talked about this before. How do these really boring ideas about internal control become hugely important? This is how. Because they, without the proper in, internal control over financial reporting, the debt covenants become jeopardized, and now suddenly the company could face bankruptcy. Somebody somewhere at the board or at the senior executive level should have strung this all together that our strategy is predicated on effective compliance and internal control over financial reporting. That's why this stuff matters, as nerdy as it might sound, to just people hanging out at the bus stop. Hugely important, and here we are. And I guess uh, maybe if we could end with this, uh, this last conversation, one of the things that struck me about Valiant and their precipitous stock dive was how much the market uh, – values the reputation of its leaders. Uh, yeah. Certainly if you get into regulatory issues, if you can't meet your debt obligations, uh, that's uh, going to be sanctioned financially. But in large part, those issues have uh, risen recently for Valiant, long before or after the stock had, had really nosedived. So it, it really brought home for me the, the reputational issue of um, company leadership, board of directors, senior management – 
that I had really not appreciated because I thought that was just sort of a too much of a touchy feely subject. Um, any real thoughts on how the market reacts uh, to the reputation of a company? You know, it, it picks up on what I said before about democratization of your brand, and don't be surprised if you know your strategy you know turns out to receive a no vote from the, the investing public. Um, but you know, you mentioned something earlier about how uh, Valiant's strategy was all predicated on deal after deal after deal. Well, you know what? That's what Berkshire Hathaway does too. That's all they do is they acquire companies. It's not like Berkshire Hathaway makes Berkshire Hathaway things on its own. So clearly acquiring deal after deal after deal, that's fine. That's valid. I mean, many people have made obscene amounts of money by investing in Berkshire Hathaway for the decades and decades. Now, what makes that company different than Valiant? I would say, number one, the quality and the personal character of the CEOs is very different. Um, you know, again, you're Jonathan Marks talking. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. And I'd like to thank you again for listening to Compliance Into the Weeds with Matt Kelly and myself, Tom Fox. I apologize for the abrupt ending, but I appreciate you listening to this podcast. And I hope you'll come back for future episodes. Thank you again.